There really is only one concern after you buy precious metals, and that is to keep them safe. And numerous customers of a precious metals vault company thought for sure that they were safe. It turns out that was not the case. We'll talk about the scam that was exposed in this video and the lessons that we can learn from it as we explore. User Billy Bob Marengo sent me a story from British Columbia from richmondnews.com about a lawsuit that is being filed against a precious metals vault company. And this is a scam that was exposed as quite an interesting story and it can really can teach us the valuable lesson that a lot of us know, and that is if you don't hold it, you truly don't own it. Now there's some nuance to that. That's an oversimplified uh, axiom, but in reality, uh, what is it about? It's about having counterparty risk. And in reality, there is other risks to actually owning precious metals too. And we're gonna talk about that in this video because I know from firsthand experience, I'll tell you about that too as we get into this. Two customers of a Richmond safety deposit box business have been given the green light to pursue claims against its owners for allegedly removing gold and other contents from their boxes. Terence Dillon Kalugan and Michael Dale Hisu each filed a civil claim against International Private Vaults, uh, IPV, which was owned and operated by Catherine Thomas and William Thomas, offered safety deposit rental for uh, boxes located in a secret vault in its office at 120 to 8160 Park Road. So I guess they stored other stuff there too. You can't store other things other than precious metals, but we know the valuable uh, aspect of precious metals. And uh, likely it's interesting to see how this has occurred. We saw uh, another business in California where this occurred, but it turns out that it was not uh, through some sort of scrupulous activity from the owners, although that was at uh, a part of the situation there, but it was the FBI who raided that facility and took innocent people's valuables. Security measures for accessing the boxes included a security key card, an iris scan, and two keys, one held by IPV and the other by the renter, according to a judgment by British Columbia Supreme Court Associate Judge John Bilowicz on the 28th of February. So in other words, I guess, you know, you put in your precious metals and into storage or whatever valuables that you have there, and you need the security key card and an iris scan in order to make its way in there. Only you and the owners have it. In their lawsuits, Kulu Yagagam and Husu claimed they rented a safety deposit box anonymously to store contents valued at about $116,000 and $176,557 respectively. Contents included coins, gold, platinum, and silver bars, and international currency. So they had uh, all these different, of course, this would be an international currency unit, right? The dollar from Canada, uh, the U.S. dollar in, in a Canadian vault. Who knows how many different currencies they had there, but they actually, it turns out, uh, had um, gold, silver, and platinum as well in there. So that's kind of intriguing to see they had platinum and they saw the value of that. But you can see that they had quite a, a great value of products in there. But in January of 2020, contents of IPV's office were seized by the landlord because IPV failed to keep its office rent in good standing. Already there's trouble there from a couple of years ago that could raise red flags in, in, in a normal situation. Um, and of course, I don't know if the, these individuals knew about that or not, but that is a red flag for sure. When Kula Yagim and Hesu demanded IPV return the contents of the boxes, IPV denied them access, claiming they failed to show IPV that they were the renter, Bilowicz wrote. I guess when they did do it anonymously, that is, uh, can be a problem too, but it just goes to show you that, you know, there's a lot of different factors that come into play, and that really does elevate this idea of the counterparty. Uh, bringing the risk into the factor here. Uh, crazy to think about, but yes. 
So uh, now, according to William Thomas's affidavit sworn in Kuliagim's lawsuit, all security and computer equipment in IPV's former office, including a server that stored iris scan data, was destroyed during uh, the distraint of re-letting process and impaired IPV's ability to identify customers. That's the reliance of technology. When you think technology is definitely good and be able to provide uh, a valuable resource uh, that is very secure, well, it can be hacked or it can go away or it can be destroyed, uh, leaving those contents uh, um, and that technology not available so you can't be able to get into your secure situation there. Pretty intriguing, I would say. Interesting. Uh, shows to show you the impairment that technology, the impediment that it could have against being able to get into your uh, valuables. And uh, the, he had alleged IPV, Catherine and William Thomas removed and converted the contents of his box and wrongfully conspired to take possession and control of the contents without lawful authority. That's over $100,000 in his case alone. And sought the return of the contents among other remedies. Meanwhile, the other complaint from Fahisu, who initially sued only IPV, alleged the defendants removed and converted the contents of his box and IPV breached its trust obligations. He later applied to add Catherine and William Thomas as defendants, which uh, Balowicz granted in the February 28th judgment and alleged they knowingly assisted IPV in the breach. His who sought the return of the box contains claiming any money or assets unaccounted for as subject to remedial uh, constructive trust and damages. Uh, both uh, Kulinyagyam and Jesus' boxes were ordered by the court to be inv inventoried and originally applied for a default judgment against IPV back in May of last year in 2023, but IPV ultimately filed a response to the civil claim. The court later issued a consent order in November of that year for the contents of the box to be inventoried by counsel or mutually agreed third party. But on June 2nd, Hsu obtained a default judgment against IPV after IPV failed to respond to the lawsuit. And they were required to deliver the items listed by Hsu or pay him their value. When IPV applied to set aside the default judgment, a British Columbia Supreme Court justice declined the request but allowed the parties to retain a third party to inventory the contents of Hsu's box before they were delivered to Hsu's counsel. Kuluyangagam's box was empty when inventoried and only silver items were found in Hsu's box, which Hsu's lawyer suggested had a collective estimated value of about $2,500. And so this thing is going to be tied up in the courts for a while, and it'll be very interesting to see what plays out. And that's just it. If it's going to be tied up in the courts for quite a number of years or months or what have you, it makes you wonder exactly... Um, you know, how, how this will play out, and they have no longer have access to the contents there, and really, they don't own it, any of it. It's all stuck in litigation, and being stuck in litigation is certainly a bad thing if you need those contents, especially if they're precious metals, right away. You're going to take market losses if you want to sell at any high in a given period of time during that process. So, there's a number of different factors and things that are at play here that all can be in limbo potentially for years before they get any kind of restitution or judgment. And who knows, they may be found to not, they may lose that case. If they lose that case, then all bets are off the table. That means they don't truly own it, which means that unless you have something in your possession where you can guard it, you truly don't own it. And that is the case for the derivatives market, which I understand the benefits of being able to uh, make a uh, play on the derivatives market for ETFs because you're not really worried about premiums. And liquidity is much easier in that regard because you're only exposed to silver and gold's price. But I like the idea of having some in your possession. And what does it mean to have this possessive nature of precious metals? Well, it's not without risk. That's for sure. We know that. I've talked about that on this channel before. It's called single party risk. No one talks about single party risk. If you hold precious metals in your possession, uh, then that means you are the risk 
or the location is the risk. Single party, if you're in control of your location, well, you can still be burglarized or you can be robbed, which is even worse, which means that puts your life at jeopardy, potentially, if you're robbed of your belongings. Been there, done that, learned my lesson. And that's why security is of the utmost importance. What does security look like? It means having a good surveillance system, preferably around every square inch in and outside of your home. I know it's time consuming and can be expensive, but it is worth it for peace of mind to have that. Number two is to be well protected inside your own home. Your home is your castle, guarded as such. Have a lot of weaponry, and even more importantly, a lot of bullets. And I like the idea of having a gun in every room of the house so that you can be prepared at a moment's notice just in case uh, the security system fails or what have you, or somebody breaks in regardless of the security system. I always have good locks and, and everything on the doors anyway, just in case. But uh, your home is important. Uh, th that, that castle doctrine really is, really uh, what it amounts to is, is the, just the fact that you can protect yourself no matter what. You assume the worst if somebody's gonna break in your house. That means that they're gonna take your life. Take theirs before they take yours. No question about that. Something I've learned as well too. And uh, that is the, the bottom line is to have a lot of protection in the home and uh, of all sorts, because uh, these precious metals can be stolen from you and you are the impediment to potentially them being gone, which is, means that's where the single party risk comes into play. Protect yourself, protect your loved ones, protect your valuables. You worked hard for your precious metals and uh, I hate, the, I hate it when you have that in somebody else's hands. Now, part of what I do is I actually don't store many of these in my location. And, but the you have to have a great amount of trust in that third party in the case. So I have third party risk. Uh, you have to have a great amount of trust there, more so than you would from an agency that you're paying for. Of course, you need to pay in other ways too, but understand that. But uh, I, I take things a little bit to the extreme when it comes to security, but I, I think that's a, uh, I feel better and I feel have a peace of mind about it. But nonetheless, uh, you control it and you know the deal and you know your own risk and you have to play that and weigh that uh, in one form or another. So there you go. Thanks again to Billy Bob for sending this to me. Very interesting piece and a valuable lesson to us all. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section down below. I'd like to extend a multitude of gratitude to each and every one of you for taking the time to watch and to encourage you to please rate, share, comment, and subscribe.